Hey everybody, how's everyone doing? Uh, good evening. I'm coming to you with uh, my brothers Dioscoros and Dionysius. Uh, we're going to talk about how Chalcedon was essentially an historian council and uh, Diophysitism is refuted point blank by uh, the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431. Thank you for joining me, Dioscoros and Dionysius. Appreciate you guys. Anytime. Anytime, anytime. All right. How do you guys want to get started with this? What should we do? Um, how about we go through the quotations in the PDF on the notes for Ephesus 1? Awesome. Let's let me see. let me know if you need to uh, any help to present. I can I can do my slides, which in, include those same quotes. Well, okay. Yeah. First, do the PDF and then maybe the slides. Sounds after good. Subsequent. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Let's see here. And when you have it pulled open on the first page, we'll just start with the maybe the first quotation from Saint Cyril, first letter to Sassensus. Sure. Um, um, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to get it up here. Hold on. Is it on one of your tabs? Yeah, it's here, but I don't know how to put it on to the screen. Uh, um, are you screen shared? No. Let's see where I how can I do that? Um mm -hmm. Dionysius, do you have the PDF? Uh, I have the PowerPoint. I include the same uh quotes on there. Okay, let's just do that then. Go ahead, Dionysius, since you you I, have the same quote. Do you, do you know can can you lead us through how you can Share your screen. Share like your screen on the screen yard, so that you can just share it with the PDF format. I think he's doing. You're doing it, Dionysius. Uh, I'm including uh, one last screenshot from uh, San Gregorio of Neza, and then uh, my presentation should be ready to uh, go. Okay. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, do you think, Dionysius, you can walk Subdeacon Daniel through how to share his screen, perhaps, while he's trying to, uh, while you're trying to finish that? I don't even see that option here. Mm. Oh, there you go. I see it. I'm okay. requesting to present. Yep. Ah, okay. Go for it. Beautiful. You have it up on your on your uh, screen. The sharing. So uh, Dionysius just did it. Perfect. Yeah. So. Uh, why Chalcedonianism and Nestorianism is the first thing. Uh, so we have uh, a couple quotes from the Fathers of Ephesus 1. Uh, I will, I will uh, explain like the, the quote and I'll have Discourus, uh, or Daniel read it. Um, so let's go here. So the first couple of quotes is the first, it will be the very first quote is from St. Uh, Arcadius of Maltin, uh, so to uh, St. Cyril, which actually he receives a response from St. Cyril. Um, Daniel, could you please read the quote for us? Sure. The first one? I'll read, yes, read the uh, first one for us, if you All would right. please. Let everyone be forced to publicly anathematize the dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore, especially those who say two natures after the union, properly each wor one working. For of those who are Ger Germanica, I have found some experienced indeed refusing to say two sons, but indeed not refusing to say two natures. Wherefore, if it be granted that it may be said and taught by them that each nature worketh by itself 
and this indeed is suffered, but that remaineth impassive, there is no such thing than to confess two sons again and bring in the parts. Epistle so, this one uh, by Saint Agakius of Melitene, who was one of the bishops who presided at the Council of Ephesus with Saint Cyril. He's recorded in the Acts of the Council of Ephesus as uh, with jointly with Saint Theodotus of Ancyra as having rebuked Nestorius personally in public because they were friends of Nestorius when he started preaching his doctrines. What you just read, Subdeacon Daniel, was Saint Akakis of Melitene's first epistle to Saint Cyril of Alexandria. It was written in 433 AD. It was written uh, essentially in response to what had happened in 433 with the reunion between Joan of Antioch and Saint Cyril of Alexandria. And so he's basically saying, what's going on? This is going on and they should know that this to nature after the union stuff is a fundamental error of Nestorius. That's pretty interesting since lately there has been this uh, speculation that a certain Assyrian Nestorian cleric is a Nestorian, which sure he is, but the reason why he's a Nestorian is that he confesses that the natures, the parts, remain too after the union. He brings the parts in after the union. This letter was responded to by Saint Cyril of Alexandria in his somewhat famous letter 40 to Saint Akakius Melitene. What should be noted? <laughs> we, we have the response. That, uh, we, we have uh, a response here. And where we have the response to Saint Cyril gives him, uh, where he talks about how the du duality is abolished. But, but go ahead, yeah. uh, just in case you were going to quote it, because it, it's on there for everyone uh, to see. You have it on the thing? In this way, we have the idea of the elements of the one and unique Son and Lord, Lord Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. We speak of two natures being united. But after the union, the duality has been abolished, and we believe the Son's nature to be one, since he is one Son yet become man and incarnate. So the duality is abolished. In other words, bringing in the parts. Yes, that is heretical, St. Akakius. Good job. And that's why, by the way, we should have maybe first read the beginning of the letter where St. Cyril of Alexandria notes that he received the letter. And he says in the beginning of the letter, addressing one another is a sweet thing for brothers and admirable and deserving of all consideration among those of truly sound thinking. And I say that it is necessary that those of one faith and of one soul unceasingly should hasten to do this. He says later on, delighted therefore exceedingly at the letter from your excellency and having marveled at your disposition towards me, I thought it proper to make known to you the way in which peace came about for the churches and to indicate how everything happened. So that was, essentially how the letter opened up so we see substantially saint cyril says the duality is abolished but that's not what chalcedonians believe they believe that christ is of the parts is in the parts and is the very conjunction of the two parts that's why john of damascus says in uh his exposition that union only signifies conjunction so uh sunafeya and so um, that's important to note. Um, so we, we read that first, to be honest, we should have maybe read the, um, maybe first it would have been a good idea to have read the homilies of St. Theodotus of Ancyra since those are part of the Council of Ephesus. Do, uh, can, can someone actually get the PDF up though? The notes on the Council of Ephesus PDF? We, we, we have the note, uh, the, the letters of St. Theodotus of Ancyra. I, I don't mind uh, getting the PDF real quick though, if that's what you want. Yeah, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll that, try going that, to the next slide while I do that, because it's going to take uh, a little bit of time to download it. Uh, I think some yeah, of them are included there. Yeah, yeah, that's fine.
So by the way, so that we can recap for people. So far, we have two saints, Saints Cacius of Melitene and Cyril of Alexandria, jointly and together, like both of them at the same time and together, these people who presided at the Council of Ephesus condemn two natures after the union. Saint Akakius defining the heresy of Nestorius as that very thing, as the especially, right? Especially those who say two natures after the union. Um, and Saint Cyril is like, yep, good job, nailed it. And he actually adds something a little bit more anti diophysite than Saint Akakius included, because Saint Ak what was missing from Saint Akakius's letter? It wasn't missing, so to speak. Because he didn't have to include it, but it was good that Saint Cyril included it. Okay, so I just put the, I just yep. put the PDF on the on the screen. It's just a, it's just small, you know. Can you do uh, Control Plus Plus? Let's see. Small as you go. Um. Yeah. Uh, it, it looks good. It looks good on uh, our YouTube. Uh, I have the YouTube live pulled up. Uh, it's very uh, legible. They can read it. Okay. okay, great. Okay, good. Could you scroll to the Saint Cyril first letter to the census and read that, and then the further on, which extends the second page? Oh, and for for this quote from uh, Saint Cyril to the letter of the census, but notice how he's putting two natures. And what uh, context he's putting two natures on, and who's to blame for people teaching two natures? Okay. You want to read that subdeacon? Yeah, I'm. I'm reading where it says Saint Cyril, first letter to Cisensis, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. Until the end of the further on quote that extends slightly into the second page. All right. Since your perfection inquires whether or not one ought to admit that there are two natures in Christ, I thought it necessary to address this point. A certain Diodore, who had previously been uh, Numotomachian, so they say, came into communion with the Orthodox Church, having shook off, as he supposed, the contagion of Macedonianism, he went down straight away with another sickness. He thought and wrote that he who was born of the line of David from the Holy Virgin was one distinct son, and the word of God the Father was again another and quite distinct son. Disting, disguise, uh, disguising the wolf in sheep's clothing, he pretended to say that Christ was one, but he referred to the tide only to the word and only begotten son born of God the Father. Nestorius became this man's pupil. And being rendered dim by his books, he also pretends to confess one Christ and Son and Lord, though he too has divided the one and indivisible into two. As I have, wait, to, huh. oh wait, so uh, there, we I see that he, Saint Cyril, yeah. sees it necessary hmm. to address the question whether there are two natures in Christ. To first say that these people divided the one Son into two, right. Well, let's see what he says further on. Okay. As I have said, if we understand the manner of the incarnation, we shall see that two natures come together with one another, without confusion or change in an indivisible union. The flesh is flesh and not Godhead, even though it became the flesh of God. And similarly, the word is God and not flesh, even if he made the flesh his very own in the economy. Given that we understand this, we do no harm to that a concurrence into union when we say that it took place out of two natures. After the union has occurred, however, we do not divide the natures from one another, nor do we sever the one and indivisible into two sons, but we say there is one son, and as the Holy Fathers have stated, one incarnate nature of the word. So we see here that St. Cyril refers to the constituents in isolation from each other, that is uh, not one being word and the other being flesh. And he contrasts this with the union where one becomes proper to the other. So when you enumerate two and theoria, you are saying that the word is all that is proper to the word. And then another, the flesh is all that is proper to the flesh. But then in the union, because the word becomes proper to the flesh and the flesh becomes proper to the word, just as uh, the soul and the body are two natures which are conceived of in isolation from each other. 
the enfleshed soul and the uh, ensouled flesh are one and the same after the union. There's no distinction between enfleshed soul and ensouled flesh because you're just naming the whole, the same whole. Now, um, so we see this very clearly that he says, after the union has occurred, however, that however means that there is a distinction between how we speak about what the union takes place out of and what the product of union is. That's why he says we do not divide the natures from each other. Okay, well then what do we say? We say one incarnate nature of the word. So clearly St. Cyril is viewing the metaphysical category of the whole in the union as the same metaphysical category as the metaphysical category of the parts. That's why... Uh, St. Dukakis of Melitene speaks of bringing in the parts as, uh, you know, heresy, that this is the two natures after the union problem. So thank you, Sadiq and Daniel, for uh, reading that. I want you to read starting at, at Ephesus 431 and then just end at the end of that quote. Ephesus 431, St. Cyril's third letter to Nestorius was accepted as entirely orthodox, an exact reputation of Nestorius. In it, he states, but being made one according to nature and not converted Kataputi, you said? Yeah. yeah. And not yeah. converted into flesh, he made his indwelling in such a way as we may say that the soul of man does in his own body. Neither do we understand the manner of conjunction to be apposition, for this does not suffice for natural oneness. Pros enosion fusikin. Enosion fusikin, sorry. The one and only Christ is not twofold, even though he is understood as compounded one out of two. Different elements and in an indivisible unity, just as a man is understood as consisting of soul and body, and yet is not twofold, but rather is one from out of both. So even though the elements or the constituents <laughs> are twofold, yet Christ is not twofold. This means that Christ cannot be nothing but the parts. He can also not be in the parts, since Christ, the product of the union, is not twofold. Why? Because that would not suffice for natural oneness. Because then he would not be made one or united. Kata fusin. All right? And so it's very uh, important to see that. So this is that's part of the Council of Ephesus, but... Actually, we just began with the Council of Ephesus. If you want, you can read the, the little notes there, but the, we'll start with the St. Theodotus of Ancyra's homily one at the Council of Ephesus. It's uh, Clavis Patrum Gericorum number is 6125. Um, and uh, it's important to note... Read that first uh, quote, Subdeacon Daniel, and just read the first quote. Yeah. Go, go for it, Dionysius, you were saying something. Uh, it's important to note so that say Theodotus says homilies were read in front of everybody in the council and we don't have any record of anybody objecting and they were actually uh, included in the uh, Greek minutes of the synod so so this is yeah. this is just as much dogma this is this is just as much dogma as the third letter as the tall anatomas um and as well as Saint Gregory the theologian's uh letter to uh Cleonius the priest uh, which we'll we'll go over later but we just need to keep that in mind as we read uh, these quotes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Dionysius. That's very important for us to remember. When we're reading these homilies, the actual reason we have them preserved is because of the Acts of Ephesus. That if they weren't part of the Acts of Ephesus, we would not have these homilies today except for a fragmentary form. Um, and these homilies were utilized even before the Chalcedonian Council by... Um, St. Proclus of Constantinople, and by St. Erechtheus of Antioch in Pisidia. So, Sabdi and Daniel, please read the first. We got those, we got those too, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so the first quote from St. Theodotus, right? Yeah. Okay. For the union of two does this. It combines to each the things of the other. Because of this, then, being God, he became a human being in order that a human being might also become God. Lifted up towards divine glory by this combination so as to be a single one and itself, both divinely glorified and suffering that is what is human. 
and all who admit the union of the divinity and humanity would agree with us on them. For what has been united is no longer named two but one. If by concept you divide again and examine each according to itself, surely then you undo the union, for it is impossible both to preserve the union and to examine each at the same time according to itself. But what was united came to be one indissolute, indissolubly, and no longer becomes two. But I distinguish by rationalization only, he says. Surely then, you also undo the union with the same rationalization. For by what you might separate one from the other, by this you also sever the combination. Then why do you split the saving dispensation, thinking of two and canceling the union? Mm, so but, this is very good. Thank you so much. Uh, no longer names two, no longer becomes two, even though it is of two. And so we see again this concept of the constituents become a single one such that you cannot speak of them being two anymore. No longer, no longer. It is said twice in this quote. And if you, uh, if you split this, this saving dispensation by thinking of two, you have canceled the union. Now he says, but I didn't distinguish by rationalization only. Uh, and he's responding to his opponents who speak about uh, the, the rationalization is a form of epinoia. St. Theodotus of Enchira, so far, is the only one who I have seen who systematized the distinction between epinoia and theoria, because in his exposition on the Nicene Creed, which we'll probably eventually get to, he speaks about this uh, in similar words, but he, he speaks, uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, I'm going to read the next two, if that's okay. Hold on. Uh, Dionysius, yeah. do you want to add anything? Dioscorus is doing a wonderful job. I have, uh, I have nothing, to, nothing to add. Okay. Go, go I'm going to read the next two. Uh -huh. when, I, when the further on, it, it literally just means it's further on in the same work for the reader, just so you know. Sometimes uh, it's not separated by very much, and I just wanted to save some space. So if you want to actually read the full thing, uh, it's uh, in Frankel's uh, entry of the study of Patristica uh, on the homilies of St. Theodotus of Enchira. He includes the entire uh, content of the three homilies that which we're going to read from in um, uh, the appendix. Okay. Um, so further on. Yeah. But says he, how did the only begotten become a slave remaining what he was? and becoming what he was not. Do you then wish to understand this? Understand that he came to be, yet only he who works wonders know how he came to be. For neither are you able to tell me how the Egyptian river became blood, while the nature of the water remained unchanged. So we see this, right? The nature of the word remains unchanged, and yet he becomes man. Uh, becomes there refers to the extreme union into one nature and we'll see this yeah so um, he I, on, continuing with this idea with the uh, egyptian river becoming blood and all that if, so, if oh, i may could you please uh i think it's on the next page what uh Dioscorus is reading from uh is it possible for you to uh uh because everybody's still seeing the page that was read before. Okay, yeah, yeah, let me change the page. My bad. No, it's okay. No, <laughs> so no, I can't. Is it on the right page now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but says he... Yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah. We're good. Okay, so the, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll read it quickly So for the, for the looker to see, okay? But says he, how did the only begotten become a slave, remaining what he was and becoming what he was not? Do you then wish to understand this? Understand that he came to be, yet only he who works wonders know how he came to be. For neither are you able to tell me how the Egyptian river became blood, while the nature of the water remained unchanged. Okay, so he says further on with this same idea of the Egyptian river becoming blood, yet the nature of the water remaining unchanged. He says, how did the Egyptians river become blood, the nature of the water remaining unchanged? For the Hebrews were using it as water, but for the Egyptians, the Nile became blood. 
and remaining what it was became what it was not. How did Egypt's light become darkness, not being quenched, but remaining what it was? For it was day to the Israelites and pure light surrounding them, surrounded them. But to the Egyptians, this light was darkness. The single visible light was simultaneously light and darkness, not being changed and becoming it. A divine miracle occurred. The flame in Babylon became dew, and both are seen in the activity. For the three young men were cooled by the dew, whereas the Babylonians were burned by the flame. There were not two things or two natures, but what was seen was one and the same thing. The righteous bear witness. Ask not the mode of God's miracles. So we see explicitly how he describes the singularity of this and how there are not two things or two natures. We'll see in the vocabulary of St. Theodotus of Enchiri, he affirms that the constituents are things, right? The pragmata. And the natures are those which compose Christ. But he rejects that there are two things or two natures after the union, right? The product is one and the same thing, one in the same nature, not two natures. And we see he continues with this a little further on, saying, let them say to us, the Nestorians, by the way, they who divide the human being from God's word and who separate what was made one by the recollection of the natures, they who say that Christ is two things and for their own defense, provide the one by rationalization alone, right? This is just like the homonym alone, by the way. Check out the um, uh, um, stream from a while ago on Orthodox Metaphysics Part 1 that ICANN did a good job in. They believe it's a union by homonym, right? The rationalization is the rationalized homonym being one. And the recollection of the nature, think about that. The recollection of the natures is, as St. Akakius of Melitene describes it, as bringing in the parts after their union. That is forbidden because then you are dividing Christ and you are dissolving the incarnational dispensation. Okay. Um, Subdeacon Daniel, can you read maybe the next quote? Sure. Let's see, I got it right here. Uh, is not is for that very reason. Yeah. By the way, did for those last two quotes that I did, did the viewers see them on the screen? Yes. Thank you. For that very reason, right? Yep. For that very reason, I admit the same being is God and man. On the one hand, God before time; on the other, a human being who came to be, beginning from the birth, not two but one, not being declared as one yet rationalized as twofold. For it is necessary that the concept does not fight with the word. We do not think two, and we admit a single one. Let neither word nor concept separate what was joined by dispensation and wonder. Yet, if someone would separate by rationalization what had been joined, he would think it had been sundered and the concept would become false, having separated clearly what had always been joined. It is unnecessary to have the concept agreeing with the word. Do you say Christ is one? That the same being God and is being is God and human being? Surely then you also think of one. Yet if you say one but rationalize two, you have the concept battling with your word. So do not say two separated by some difference. For if you unite with words, do not sever with concepts. For if you sever with concepts, you deny un you deny union. So do not lead away the reasoning to, to separated natures inasmuch as God works the wonder of the extreme union. So, okay, thank you very much for that. Mm. Uh, I want to say something and then I'm going to let Dionysius say something if he wishes to. Um, uh, because we haven't heard his input in a while and I feel bad about that. But um, we say that this idea of twofold in the rationalization only being the oneness that these Nestorians confess is intrinsically linked with the natures, which St. Theodotus just said, that the recollection thereof makes them divide Christ after the union. Yeah. And so um, the 
not saying to is applied to what was joined by dispensation and wonder. Yeah. What had been joined, he would think it had been asundered if he rationalizes this too. Okay. And so, uh, I mean, it, it really couldn't get any clearer. You have the concept battling with your word, he says. Okay. So these are people who are pretending to say that Christ is one, like St. Cyril says, but they're saying that there are two natures after the union. They keep them divided by numerical distinction, numerical distinction. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and this is what had always been joined. So he's speaking about the constituents as twofold that these Nestorians are saying as the heresy. Now, um, Dionysius, would you like to add anything? Uh, so the 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 issue that we're having is is that there's no point where either the Nestorians and frankly the Chalcedonians ever say that Christ is one besides in name. So we notice that after the union, um, it has sort of this meaning place, which is the name of Christ. But then afterwards, and we we see this in the Talmud, this once it comes to injuries, the other one before needs miracles. They're not really one. You, you just have basically two oranges <laughs> connected to one bag. Um, each each part is doing what a whole would do. So in all of this, we can see that the Nestorians and the Castellanians, they, they had never at any point did they confess that two natures become one. It's uh, they're, they're not in agreement with, with the fathers, uh, since they're treating these two parts as wholes. And frankly, the 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 difference between the Nestorians and the Castellanians um, is very very little. Um, I'm sure most Castellanians, uh, if we were to send them these quotes and not uh, have. Uh, any name attached to them, and then not even say that they were accepted in that chemical council, just have them sent to them. They would think that this is from Saint Severus, or they would say this is from Saint Discourse, or something. They would, they would, they would reject it in its totality. Um, yes. And it, it gets worse from here for <laughs> for Chalcedonian. So, yeah, precisely. Thank you so much, Dionysius. And yeah, they would probably say uh, precisely, specifically, Saint Severus is what who they say. It would come from if it was presented to them and they were like somewhat learned in the controversy because the Cal historical Chalcedonian apologetic against uh, more Severus of Antioch is when he speaks about how duality divides. Well, if you think Saint Severus is wrong with that, look at what Saint Theotokos says right here. He's speaking about the duality as the central problem of these heretics. Yeah, so they're in a pickle because when they claim to accept the Council of Ephesus, then they are admitting that they are condemned from their own mouth. The Assyrian Church of the East doesn't claim to confess the Council of Ephesus, and so they don't condemn themselves out of their own mouth on this point, because they know it rebukes them. And so they're essentially just being consistent diophysites by not adhering to a an anti-diophysite council. Um, but Deacon Daniel, could you read the next quote starting with Jesus Christ is the same? Yes. Jesus Christ is the same, both God and human being, not separated either by rationalizations or reasonings. In order that we do not, separating the reasonings, the things which are united, deny the saving dispensation. For if the union of God and human being is made known through the dispensation, he who separates the union denies the dispensation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to present that even, I mean, the viewer probably recognizes that that quote is kind of just a repetition of just some of the things that we've already gone over. The reason I wanted to include this quote in particular is because he says that he who separates the union denies the dispensation. Okay, this becomes important when later on we go uh, into the first uh, epistle of St. John. Um, because it really shows that the Council of Ephesus isn't just saying, yeah, you know, all diophysites make a mistake, but um, at the end of the day, we all make mistakes. It's not saying that. It's saying actually that they deny the dispensation, and that's very serious. Um, 
Subdeacon Daniel, are you on the homily too? Uh, on, the, uh, on the screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read that one if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so this is from the second homily. We just finished with quotes from the first homily. The second homily is just uh, the next index in the uh, index, you know, item in the Clavis Patrum Great Quorum 6126. Yeah. Uh, and the same recurring theme with homily three. Um, so he says in homily two, for the Jews did not crucify a mere man, neither did they nail the visible nature only, but they brought their daring to the God who was in it, who had appropriated the sufferings of the united nature. And in order that this also should become clear to you, let us bring the word to the illustration which has, which was said in the beginning. Let it then be posited that the emperors pronounce a word and that this is imprinted on letters, in letters on some papyrus to dispatch the so-called sacra to the cities, a word clothed with both papyrus and letters, gratifying freedom or conveying another imperial bounty to the needy. But let this so-called sacra in the language of the Italians be received by someone who is an unbeliever and disobedient and hostile to the city and an enemy of the emperor. And he, having taken the papyrus, tears it apart. What was torn here? Tell me, only the papyrus or the imperial word also? And so his entire point from this is that, yes, even though the Lord Jesus Christ is composed of two natures, a visible nature of humanity and the invisible logos, that in the incarnation, he becomes a united nature. And it is this united nature which has the entire quality of soul, the entire quality of body, and the entire quality of the divinity of the logos, which is pierced by uh, the people who, due to YouTube censorship, I might not repeat the word. Um, so, yeah. And he then draws the analogy to papyrus, okay? So you have the word of the emperor. Well, the word of the emperor just vanishes into air, right? And yet this is united to papyrus such that when someone tears up that papyrus with the emperor's word and parted on it, it wasn't just the visible nature of the papyrus, but the united nature of the natures of the word and the papyrus united into the united uh, written papyrus, you could say. The, the nature of the written papyrus or the... Yeah, actually, you could say and logos papyrus, right? The lo the word, the logos. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, Subdeacon Daniel, read the homily three one? I have, I have an important uh, question. Okay. Well, you yeah. you just only provided a, a very important question. He asked, wait, how many natures does Saint Theodore say one singular unified nature? Uh oh. Uh oh. I think I think you're so sneaky good tank. <laughs> okay, ready? Yeah. All right, where are we? Uh, homily three, CPG one twenty eight. Where is he who divides? Okay. Where is he who divides? Okay, it's one twenty seven. Yes. Oh, my bad. My bad. It's okay. Yeah. On the right page on here. Yeah. Okay. Where is he who divides the Christ? Where is he who does equivocally to our mystery? And on the one hand says Christ is one, but on the other supposes two. One the slave, the other the Lord. One the sufferer, the other not, the not suffering. What is the benefit of one single appellation while p positing two things? Thank you. Um, and so we see here this... Uh, the, the same concepts really that we've seen elsewhere. We see that it's also in his third homily. Yeah. And we see that um, he's speaking about two duality and a, an equivocality. Yeah. The equivocality is contextually here, the same thing as homonym. And what Dionysius was saying earlier about the homonym, um, our viewers uh, who have seen the stream from like two days ago or whatever it was, will remember that we go over how, Theodore the Studite explicitly speaks about how the so-called union of Christ for those Chalcedonians is 
just a homonym between the natures. And he basically adds the icon of Christ or the image of Christ into that homonym, whereby it is the same hypostasis as, as Christ. Because for them, the hypostasis, the person or Christ, all of these are just names. They're just a homonym, an, equivoca an equivocation, essentially. Yeah? So um, what is the benefit of one single appellation while well, positing two things? It couldn't get any more clear. So... Um, and we'll see later that the two things and the two, I mean, he's already shown that those are the constituents, what had been joined. Okay. Uh, we'll see that he speaks about this in the exposition on the Creed of Nicaea. By the way, uh, for those below quotes from sections nine and 10, it's honestly better to just read everything from that one from section nine and up till the end of the section 10 quote, because really the whole thing is pretty useful. But uh, Subdeacon Daniel, can you read the section seven one? Yeah. Uh, okay. You will not ascend to God, O man, unless you confess the descent of God. Paul says, one is he who descended and one who ascended, not one and another. But the same is no longer divided, no longer considered two after the union. For he who ascended, he says, is also he who ascended above men so that he might fill all things. The things once contemplated two, the economy made one. So then no longer say two after the indivisible union. What grace united, let thought not divide. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as the uh, listener will recall, I earlier stated that St. Theodotus is so far the only one who I've seen who makes this um, big distinction between the epinoia and theoria that we hear about all the time with Christology. So many might think, that, and actually, there have been some scholars who have postulated that St. Theodotus did not even consider it um, legitimate to speak of two and theoria, which is false, because he actually says it here in the exposition on the Nicene Creed. Um, so he considers that the things once contemplated two are obviously the constituents, right? They are things, even though he says that the product of union is not two things or two natures. And he says they were once contemplated too. But then twice he says here, that notice that twice, it's repetition, no longer considered, no longer say too, after the indissoluble union. Earlier at the very first quote from St. Theodotus of Enchiry, he also says, no longer too, no longer too. Here he says, no longer too, no longer too. He says it twice in order to emphasize the point. That's what the Holy Fathers do when they're trying to emphasize a point. They repeat it. Um, just like how, you know, Chalcedonians respectfully repeat the enumeration of subjects by adding a second subject to Christ. Um, now, uh, so we see here that, you know, the no longer say two after the union because the economy made them one. It couldn't get any clearer than this. It couldn't get any clearer. This is the same as the anti-Chalcedonian myriology, understanding of parts and wholes. You cannot say that after the union that the parts are two. Okay. Um, Dionysius, do you have that quote from St. Theodotus of Enchiro on hand where he says, like, for just as they did not express a dual meaning about yada, yada, yada? It's the pretty long quote. Yeah, yeah. Um... No, I, I didn't put it on my PowerPoint. Uh, I can put I can put it. Uh, I, I saw that comment, by the way. Uh, I can put the uh, the paper up uh, with it if you want. Uh, it's gonna take me a minute. Well, I can add it to the presentation. I can add it to the presentation because I, 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 I want to go into. I have, I have it on the bottom. So whatever you want it up, tell me. I'll add it to the screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna add that. I'm gonna add that quote. Yeah with like the special formatting too or is it just the bare text i think it's just the bare text i think uh okay that's not a big deal i like the formatting personally but you can, i'll try to grab the formatting i'll try to grab the formatting if you can try to grab the formatting uh, the Anasius, i would really appreciate that let's uh let's read the section 13 one instead for now um and then the section 21 uh, uh Subdeacon Daniel, can you read the section 13 one okay. that starts with four, the nature was not changed? Sure. Okay, is this still, are we still on the right page on the screen though? 
No. Yeah, it was the it, last it part. It starts okay. towards the bottom of but, it and extends into the next page. Got it. For the, for the nature was not changed, but the unity of the economy performed the wonder. Therefore, after the unity of God with man, the fathers did not conceive two things, rightly calling Jesus the word of God and expressing it according to the word. Let me change word of God. Yeah. Let me change it on the screen. Okay. Yeah. According to the word of God, they indicate Jesus as the word seen, not confusing the natures, but showing the unity. For this union of the impassable word with the suffering human nature was prepared for this purpose. And this is what is meant by union, namely, that the properties of the united are brought together into one. Fantastic. Um, I want to note here that this is kind of like St. Theodotus kind of taking in a bunch of the other stuff he's already said, but then kind of just putting it into one uh, section in like one same context that he kind of summarizes everything that yes this isn't a confusion of the natures but at the same time the fathers did not conceive of two things or two natures as we you know believed uh or as we saw already in the um homily at ephesus yeah and so um and now by the way that the meaning of union that the properties of the united are brought together into one one nature uh, this is pretty reminiscent of St. Gregory the Theologian um, in, I think, uh, he wrote it against Apollinarius. He says that, how did, like, he says something like, how did a nature of diversities come together into one? And then he speaks about how the constituents of this nature are two natures. Uh, and yet he says that there is a nature of diversities which came together into one one what one nature he says it explicitly um so this is the same thought process it's kind of important to just cross reference there i, I can um, do that call daniel do you, oh, sorry dionysius do you have something else that uh i got the explanation on the creed but i can add that quote too if, if you just have people to see it very pretty one no no sir i was unable to find it but I have the quote. Oh, I love the special formatting. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll have Subdeacon Daniel read uh, the section 21, and I'll see if I can... Um, forward, forward it to you, uh, Yusuf Salib, because he's the one... Forward it to Yusuf Salib, because he's the one feeding me all the quotes. Okay, section 121. Let's see, let's see. What does it start with, Discourse? It's just a which section, it'll say section 20 in brackets. Okay. Mm. I don't see it, bro. What where is it? Um the page the same page that I just read from. Did you have that one showed up? Yeah. It's the same page. Is it uh, after he said, like where it says, Acacius of Melitine, letter one? Um, it is the same one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one? Well, the section 21 right above it, yeah. Okay. Is it above it or is that the one? The, the section 21 is the one. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I see section 20, and then it goes down into it with these homilies, and then it says St. Hecatius of Melitine. So it's that one. Yeah, yeah. All right. But in order, yeah. Let everyone be forced to publicly anathematize the dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore, especially those who say two natures after the union, properly each one working. For of those who are in Germanic... No, no. The, no, not the, the one that says section 20. Okay. But in order to make what I said clear, I will present to them the words of the deceived themselves in that epistle in which he speaks in these words. The apostle says, I am about to bring the passion, placing Christ first, the common name of the two natures, as I said a little earlier to the word, suitable to both natures. For just as above, he has permission to believe in one Lord following the exposition of the fathers, but Christ has given himself the common nature of several natures, the common name of several natures. So here he empties himself of the word, removing it sufficiently to teach that God descended into communion with human affairs. So again, like it's it's pretty 
obvious that he's condemning this idea that Christ indicates several natures, right? That there is one name, Christ, common to several natures. And uh, John of Damascus, for instance, says that the um, that the hypostasis of Christ is common to both natures. It's the same exact concept. Um, so yeah, like it's uh, it's not even a question. And by the way, like it's we're this is this is almost everything from Saint Theodotus. There's one more thing, and it's that quote. Um, I should have sent it to at least one of you guys on WhatsApp with both of you, actually. Did you guys get it? Go Anyone? Go up. Uh, uh, via WhatsApp, oh, yeah, I sent yeah, the I yeah. one super big quote. Yeah. I would like to... Uh, oh, actually, actually, uh, actually, I have that. I have that. Okay. Oh, sweet. Someone needs to just show it for the viewers, you know? Uh, could I get uh, the ability to present uh, if it's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Which, which oh. one is yours? <laughs> no, that's about. Uh, oh, that, so I tell Yusuf to send the right paper to the group chat. That, that's a long paper. That's a good paper, though. But uh, the one. Uh, the one Yusuf was talking about was uh, the, uh, the objective Nestorianism of Chalcedon, which is uh, a different paper. Uh, I'm going to text him real quick. But um, just let me, if, if it's possible, to share my slides. Okay, sure. Can you get that back up? Like you did. Oh, it's right here. It's right here. Okay, I have to to build a slide 15. Tell you what, um, so oh, hold on one second, hold on one second, there's, there's one nice quote we should, uh, here's the, uh, we find the St. Aragula quote, it's at the bottom of this page. If, if Daniel could read it for us. Yeah. For the separation of the natures troubles me much, and especially the separation after the union. Anastasius, who in the middle of Constantinople said, I confess the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and our Lord Jesus Christ, amazingly introduced to us that there are two sons instead of one. Far be it from me to agree to any of this. I would rather accept with joy to endure anything else than to participate in any blasphemy such as this marabula. Yeah. yeah. It's, that's, it's that's important to note that uh, he's equating two natures after the union to two sons. So th th this is how we know that all the fathers during this time period had agreed that the natures in the, in the incarnation are particulars. No, absolutely. Uh, so we need to keep in mind, and, and we have uh, the, the section on this on the slideshow later, with the Nestorians, they're honest. They tell us, yeah, there are two particulars, the two hypotheses, deal with it. But with the Chalcedonians, they're very inconsistent. Like, depending on who they're talking to and what time period, all oh, their universal natures. And then uh, 200 years later, another father from them. No, no, actually, they're two individuals because if they're two universals, how would we have been able to see Christ? So it'd be very, very inconsistent. Uh, right. Very inconsistent. Well, and of Antioch says explicitly that, and maybe we'll get to this later in your uh, slide. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, Talk. I, I, yeah. Somebody say something. Uh, I'm, I'm saying something. So, go, go what I would like you to do, Subdeacon Daniel, is actually to go back to the notes on Council of Ephesus paper and then go to like page four. And that what I'll do is I'll simply read the long quote that extends into both sections nine and 10. And the viewer can just look at like different parts of the quote at the same time. Okay. Uh, by the way, I got the uh, exhibition of the creed. Uh, for Yusuf finally sent it, so. Okay, you want, uh, did he send it to me too? Uh, I got it on the. Uh, I uh, I copy and paste. I copied and pasted it onto the slide. It's formatted correctly. Okay. Okay. You got it. Oh, it's okay. formatted correctly. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, are sir. Are you the presenter, Dionysius? No, no, no. You're not. 
Where's okay, the well, where's the know. where's the PowerPoint, Dionysius? Where is it? Uh, I'm getting it. Look, man, I'll come up for Egypt. I'm I'm a simple person. Please. No problem. No problem. Um, <laughs> uh, we we got we got it. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes I'm a little bit sidey too. Um, so. Uh, so Deacon Daniel, are you on like page five of that PDF? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And is it visible for the viewers as the like current presenter thing? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want us to kind of go through the Saint Akakius and then sit two Saint Cyril quotes from his response letter again. Low key. I'm sorry to the viewer for the repetition, but I want the uh, you know formatting to be there while we're reading it because that can be helpful um i'm going to read that if that's okay yeah go for it i'm going to step out for one second okay okay go for it last time that happened there was bad things um <laughs> <laughs> okay so saint akakis the melatine says in his first letter to saint cyril uh this is clavis patrum gray quorum uh, index number five seven nine three let everyone be forced to publicly anathematize the dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore, especially those who say two natures after the union, properly each one working. For of those who are in Germanicea, I have found some experienced indeed refusing to say two sons, but indeed not refusing to say two natures. Wherefore, if it be granted that it may be said and taught by them that each nature worketh by itself, and this indeed is suffered, but that remaineth and passes. There is no other thing than to confess two sons again and bring in the parts. Okay, we kind of went over already how, like, uh, respectfully, it's it, we don't need to go over how this is not uh, allowing any kind of diophysitism. Like, it's pretty obvious. So, um, Dionysius is the, are the two succeeding quotes visible for the viewer from saint cyril the uh, right now yes sir they're they're able to be viewed uh let's go so uh, cyril, have you. Uh, says, starting out with the letter addressing one another is a sweet thing for brothers and admirable and deserving of all consideration among those of truly sound thinking and i say that it is necessary that those of one faith and of one soul unceasingly should hasten to do this Delighted, therefore, exceedingly at the letter from your excellency and having marveled at your disposition towards me, I thought it proper to make known to you the way in which peace came about for the churches and to indicate how everything happened. So we see he agrees with the letter. He's not saying, uh, you are a proto Eutychian heretic, St. Akakius. Um, and by the way, I have seen in some literature that scholars will say that St. Akakius was a monophysite and then repented of it, even though St. Akakius died before the home synod of Constantinople. So it's like, um, they basically read this and they went, eh, must have repented eventually, I guess, which is pretty funny. Um, so St. Cyril, as we have gone over, this is a different translation, but it's the same concept. Yeah. Um, he says further on in the letter, wherefore we say that the two natures were united from which there is one and only son and Lord Jesus Christ as we accepted our thoughts, but after the union, since the distinction into two is now done away with, we believe that there is one nature of the son since he is one son. It is done away with. Chalcedonians, Diophysites, is the distinction into two that you had accepted into your thoughts done away with after the union? If it's not, then you have to disagree with St. Theodotus, St. Nicacius, and St. Cyril, the three foremost presiders of the Council of Ephesus who wrote concerning Christology. And are um, on, on the PowerPoint slides, uh, we have a slide where we kept the uh, Chalcedonians uh, and their fathers lacking. I thought where they're admitting there's two natures at the union. Uh, if we could go into that before we, uh, if, uh, if, before we get to the exposition of the Creed, uh, just so we can show uh, how they have the same exact formula as the Nestorians. And and their formula is the exact same one that was condemned by all the uh, fathers of Ephesus. It's not a question. 
it's not even a question anymore at this point. Um, I like, I really like the apologetic of some Melkites against uh, filioquism, where they'll say, listen, if you want to understand what the creed means when it says that the spirit proceeds from the father, then you should read the Cappadocian fathers, since their milieu uh, is, is this, is the creedal issues. And so if they reject the filioque, uh, and they're the ones who have the right to interpret what the creed says, then it's pretty obvious what the creed means. That's an excellent point to raise, because they are the mind of the Council of Constantinople. Well, in the same way, these three fathers who we've read from are the mind of the Council of Ephesus, and their works are literally, that we've read, are literally part of the Council of Ephesus. And even for the works like St. Akakius that aren't part of the Council of Ephesus, they are in the exact milieu of the Council of Ephesus, and they were agreeing with each other, St. Sakakius and Cyril. Um, Sadiq and Daniel, are you here? Yes. So um, I would like you to go to page six, the next page. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over some cool stuff from St. Cyril of Alexandria, some pretty cool stuff because it kind of cuts to the heart of the matters of the diophysite controversy in kind of unique angles and it, it's just a really good way to approach it in my opinion okay. um I'm, uh, I'm on page six okay so you see okay, do you have kind of like uh in maximized view for the viewer the the greek text yes and the in the english of, about Below it, sorry. Yeah. So I'm gonna read this one. So and um, you can look at um, Saint uh, Cyril of Alexandria's three Christological treatises, translated by uh, Daniel King, and um, one of them is his defense of the twelve chapters to the bishops of the Orients. There's also the one to Theodoret. So just so you know, there's two defenses. So just keep this in mind. Um, in here, he says, and by the way, this is. Uh, directly and exactly what the Greek text says, because that's very important. For if the union is genuine, there are certainly not two in any way, but one and soul from both is how Christ is understood. If we break down that uh, sentence, agar alithes he enosis, that is if the union is genuine or if the union is true. O duo po hantos asin, then he said he's emphasizing the point there, by the way. He's saying there are not two, certainly, uh, or there basically not two, there are not certainly. And uh, I mean, the Greek, St. Cyril's Greek is kind of weird, but that's what it literally means. And then he says, ala ace te kaimonos. That ace means one, by the way. So, but, al, ace, te kai monos, but one and soul. One and soul what? Ho ex em fo yin no etai Christos. That is, but one and soul from both is how Christ is understood. So even though Christ is from both, there are still certainly not at two in any way if the union is genuine. His meaning couldn't be any clearer. This is a muriological point, okay? This doesn't fit with diophysitism in any way whatsoever. It, Saint Cyril couldn't possibly be clearer. Um, Subdeacon Daniel, can you read the next quote from the second letter to Sussensis? We read the first letter to Sussensis from the first letter to Sussensis. Sussensis had questions afterwards, and we have um, uh, what's it called? Fragments of Sussensis preceding letter to Saint Cyril, where he's basically talking about how there are some people who seem close to the faith who um but who say that there's two natures mm -hmm. after the union and produce an argument for that uh, and this is saint cyril's response to it. can you read this one saint or sorry subdeacon <laughs> <laughs> i wish right okay yeah here we go um, on saint cyril a second letter to the census yeah yeah okay the objection is yet another attack on those who say that there is one incarnate nature of the Son. 
They want to show that the idea is foolish, and so they keep on arguing at every turn that two natures endure. They have forgotten, however, that it is only those things that are usually distinguished at more than a merely theoretical level, which split apart from one another in differentiated separateness and radical distinction. Let us once more take the example of an ordinary man. We recognize two natures in him, for there is one nature of the soul and another of the body, but we divide them only at a theoretical level and by subtle speculation, or rather, we accept the distinction only in our mental intuitions, and we do not set the natures apart, nor do we grant that they have a radical separateness, but we understand them to belong to one man. That is why the two are no longer two, but through both of them, the one living creature is rendered complete. Thank you. Um, and so it really couldn't be any clearer. I mean, Dionysius, do you, do you think it could be any clearer than this? Uh, I'm not saying two natures after the union. Uh, so, uh, Dionysius, I, I, I see think... two natures after the union. It's, uh, they keep on enduring, they keep on arguing at every turn that two natures, oh, wait, never mind, he's rejecting Oh, I, 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 I don't think you're accepting it, guys. It did sound looking good. So, so Dionysius, you want to you want to add some stuff um, before we go on to the next point from Dioscoros? But I want to tell you guys both: can we link the articles, the PDFs, for the viewers in the description? Is that possible? Uh yes, and uh, we have it in uh, uh, the Lions Den Discord server. Okay, beautiful. The we yeah, could, uh, the Discord server, and we have it in the Crystallogical Library in awesome. the Discord server. Oh, I'll have Yusuf uh, edit it. If he's still in the chat, I don't know why he's been quiet. And uh, my apologies to the viewer because I meant to, by now, have to to have made something more extensive. But this is keep in mind to the viewers that this is only kind of like the surface of what exists in the primary sources. There's more stuff that exists. Uh, just due to my sins, I haven't, you know gotten through the effort of adding it to a more extensive document but in good time god willing we will um uh who wants to i i mean i'll i'll read the actually no something continue you read the next one christological dialogue with hermes the priest one okay uh Dionysius, did you want to add anything uh <laughs> The, this X quote is, is very good and damaging to the Castonians, but I would like, uh, if I could, please, to yeah. have access to the presentation just so Absolutely. we can show. Absolutely, please. Go for it. Uh, can you change slides or only I can? Uh, I can change slides. Uh, so the next quote I can't uh, is. Here. The, yeah, the next quote is here, by the way. Okay. Oh, and I also added uh, another quote. A quote from Saint Cyril, uh, where he rejects uh, two after the union. Uh, we could, if we could have those two read. Okay. All right. So, like, I'm, am I on the right slide for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is perfect. Uh, so uh, which, course, which do you, want to, do you want me to read? Okay. Uh, could you read the, the two first quotes? Okay. Uh, so Hermias as asking Saint Cyril, right? Should you not therefore distinguish in any way? Certainly not, and especially not to speak of two after the union and conceive each of them separately. It is necessary to know as a result that the mind contemplates some distinction of natures, for divinity and humanity are certainly not the same thing, but at the same time to admit concerning these concepts the both coming together into union. Before, Fantastic. before, therefore, he is truly God and King according to nature, and because the one crucified has been called the Lord of glory, how could anyone hesitate to call the Holy Virgin the Mother of God? Adore him as one without dividing him into two after the union. Then the senseless Jew shall laugh in vain. Then, in truth, he shall be the one who slew the Lord, and he shall be convicted as the one who has sinned, not against one of those who are like us, but against God himself, the Savior of all. So we can explicitly see St. Cyril denies Trinitian of the Union, and he goes even further, and he, cond he condemns those who confess Trinitian of the Union, as well as those who split, who actually assassinated the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to add something brief. I'm sorry. 
for ranting, but um, when he says, St. Cyril says, and especially not to speak of two after the union, what does that sound like? What does that sound like? It sounds like St. Akakius, right? Mm -hmm. It's an echo of the very letter that St. Akakius said to him, especially those who say two natures after the union. And so we see that this is what some Holy Fathers will do with each other. They're kind of piggyback off of each other. And so we see the mutual connecting in the agreement in various way between these Holy Fathers. So, yeah. Okay. So are we going to stay with this or should we go back um, to the paper? Whatever I, you want, Dionysius. This is the, uh, this is the Saint, uh, I can't pronounce his name, the one uh, Discourse knows this is the homily that was given in front of uh, Saint Proclus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's two homilies <laughs> that are confirmed to be by Saint Erectius of Antioch and Pisidia. There's one where we don't know if it was by Saint Erectius or if it was by Saint Proclus. Uh, this one was delivered in the presence of Saint Proclus, and it's one of the many things. This is one of the lesser proofs, but it is at least one way to show that St. Proclus was a miaphysite and was anti Um, but yeah. Okay, should I read it? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. By Isaiah the great prophet, the child is proclaimed as God. For a child, he says, has been born to you, a son uh, born to us. A son has been given, to, given us whose government has been upon his shoulder. And his name is called Angel of Mighty Counsel, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Ruler, Prince of Peace, Father of the World to Come. Let not the Jewish branch therefore deceive you, for that is what one ought to call heretics, saying that the born is one thing and the indwelling God another, and that the born has two natures. If anyone ventures to say this, oppose him simply with Emmanuel, and he will receive the mention of the name as a bridle of silence. For he is not two natures, but the virgin, sorry, the virgin receiving the overshadowing of the spirit gave birth in mysterious fashion to God incarnate. For if Christ is a growth of human seed, I should have agreed that fruit must resemble root in nature. But if he is of the Holy Ghost in accordance with the archangel's words, he who is born is God because God is the cause of his birth. I mean. So, so the, this is just uh, another condemnation of the heresy of Judaism after Union by Miaphysites as being uh, a Judaizing heresy. Um, and he's explicitly rejecting that he's two natures after the Union. Uh, so, with this in mind, we have to see what the fathers of Chalcedon say as uh, Dioscorus went over when talking about the Cappadocians. Uh, and we have their Christological formula from Chalcedon and afterwards uh, in, in this uh, presentation. So let me go here. There we go. There, there, there's two slides that I go over this with. Uh, Daniel, could you please read the uh, slide? Okay. Exact same formula as Nestorius, for Christ is not only out of, but also in these parts. And what is still more proper to say, Christ is these parts, Maximus. Letter 15. Take it to so, a oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah, so as, as we can see, uh, they nearly see Christ as a juxtaposition of, of these two parts, even after after the Union, uh, which is no different than what Nestorius teaches and is no different than what Mar Mari was teaching uh, in his uh, prayers, and he's being condemned for saying the same thing as one of the greatest so-called Castellanian fathers that they have. Uh, the second quote goes into John uh, Damascene, if you, if you would please uh, read it. Okay. But if two and not one, why will you not, I say, cast delusion far away along with its father, the devil? And confess with us one Christ, one Son, one Lord, one hypostasis out of two. And two natures and in two natures after the union. For if you never confess that Christ has two natures, why do you pointlessly say that he has one nature after the union? Experience a condemnation of the fathers of Ephesus 1 and of St. Cyril. Like, uh, I don't know how much more clear this could get. 
Um, and the next couple of quotes are, are from the, the, the supposedly divinely inspired Synod of Kalsalon, in which they accept the, the Nestorian two natures after union uh, formula. Okay. All right. And are you want me to read the Chalcedonian quote here? Uh, if you would, please. Basil, the most devout bishop of Seleucia in Isoria, said, What I said was acknowledged in two natures after the union, perfect godhood, perfect man. Council of Chalcedon, session 1176. You want me to read these? Yeah, uh, um, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Constantine, the most devout deacon, said the statement of, of the grounds for the Archmandrite's deposition is missing. The, the Lord, our Archbishop, made this demand to him. Say two natures after the union and anathematize those who do not say it. It was when he refused to anathematize, saying, Woe is me if I anathematize the Holy Fathers, that he carried out his deposition. His statement is missing, but was then read. Constantine, the most devout deacon, said, I have already said that the Lord, our Archbishop, asked the Archmandrite, do you say two natures after the union and do you anathematize those who do not say two natures? These words are not in the minutes. This is why he was deposed for not anathematizing. So this is in reference to the uh, Home Synod of 448, uh, which shows that Flavian uh, of Constantinople uh, did hold to the Nestorian two natures after the union uh, formulation. Uh, which is why he was rightfully deposed in Ephesus 2, which was which you guys went over in a, in another stream. Uh, Dioscorus, do you, is he still on or? Yeah, I'm still on. Um, so I might I might want to kind of go soon. Like I'm kind of getting a little bit tired. I've had a long day. Um, so what I what I would like to do, if it's okay with you, Dionysus, is I would like Subdeacon Daniel to switch to hit the PDF. And to basically continue, and we'll go through the kind of like the points I wanted to go through, and then uh, we'll switch to yours for the rest of the stream. Is that okay? Yeah, and the, uh, after this, it should just be the. Uh, I'm just going yeah, to show. A perfect segue, segue because of what you just said. Uh, what, what you I didn't even know that you had that in your in your thing because that's perfect for where the next spot is because this is in reference to Saint Athanasius teaching, in the Flavian required. Eutyches to anathematize saints Cyril and Athanasius specifically because those are those who do not say it contextually in the home synod as Eutyches spoke about. Go ahead, go ahead. Are you are you are you presenting right now, Sadiqan Daniel? I have it's your up. paper. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can you read the Saint Cyril of Alexandria defense of the twelve chapters to the bishop citing Saint Pope Athanasius thing? Sure, sure, sure. One second, we get it. Up right now. It should be page uh, seven. Okay. Okay. All right. We confess that he is the Son of God and God in the Spirit and man in the flesh. We do not confess that this single Son is two natures, one to be worshipped and one not, not to be worshipped. He is rather one incarnate nature of the Word and is to be worshipped with his flesh with a single worship. So thank you. This is what Saint Athanasius the Apostolic says, and this is what uh, in uh, Saint Cyril of Alexandria literally is quoting it in this, uh, obviously approving it. So he, with his very hand, uh, gifted with the Holy Spirit in all matters of wisdom, wrote this down on the papyrus or the whatever he's using. So the Chalcedonians really have no excuse because even if they want to pretend that it's an Apollinarian forgery which is not, but even if they wanted to pretend that, St. Cyril is obviously backing it, and no one said that this is a forgery, not even the historians. And John, uh, um, if it's, and even John, the did, might have considered a lot of the St. Athanasius stuff to have not been a forgery, but I... I John Dem, uh, Damascene... Um, hold on, hold on, the, the score. Go ahead. Yeah. John Damascene uh, actually explicitly, explicitly refers to this quote, and then he tries to cope out of it. He tries to say, oh... Yeah, it's true. Saints Athanasius and Cyril did say this, and, and we can have that quote uh, posted in the description, or I could comment it. Um, but uh, he he copes basically. He just says, "Yeah, but look," he says, "one incarnation of the word that means essence plus essence equals hypostasis, but doesn't really equal hypostasis because the two remain two. So, 
So even even their own yeah. fathers, or one of their greatest fathers, I'm explicitly. Sure this, but we see very yeah. clearly that what you had read uh, from before, well, from before in your presentation, Dionysius, uh, is that with the home synod of Constantinople, Flavian went even more Nestorian than the stories because sure, the stories condemned Saint Cyril of Alexandria, no question about it. That was his arch enemy. Uh, but Nestorians never actually anathematized Saint Athanasius. No one would have dared to have done that until, apparently, Flavian dared to require Eutyches to do that, and he tried to do it in a subtle way, because remember, in the home synod throughout, Eutyches is like, but Saint Athanasius and Cyril don't say two natures after the union. Um, and so Flavian, uh, you know, eventually is like, not only do you have to say it for me to not anathematize you, but you also have to condemn those who do not say it. Well, those who do not say it are Saints Cyril and Athanasius. Uh, it's it's a just a contextual thing. Like, it's very obvious. Um, Subdeacon Daniel, uh, can you scroll down to the next page, page 8? And I want to kind of note something, actually, um, with... Can you go to the Socrates Scholasticus quote and read that, Subdeacon? Now, Nestorius was evidently unacquainted with the fact that in... The first Catholic epistle of John, it was written in the ancient copies. Every spirit that separates or dissolves Jesus is not God, of God. The mutilation of this passage is attributable to those who desire to separate the divine nature from the human economy. Or to use the very language of the early interpreters, some persons have corrupted this epistle aiming at separating the manhood of Christ from his deity. Thank you. Um, so, as you know, many people will know who are viewing this, uh, the first epistle of St. John has kind of like an interesting textual tradition, right? Like with the Comma Johannium, um, I think it's without a doubt that it's authentic because St. Cyprian says that it is written. And St. Jerome, in his uh, prologue to this epistle, talks about how there were, with, with this epistle, talks about how they were either heretical or at least like scribes who were just you know not being uh i guess faithful um who ha caused a lot of problems and so in most bibles don't have the what i believe is the proper transmission of this verse um and uh, but socrates scholasticus is backing up saint jerome's vulgate which does have what seems to be the most ancient transmission of it, that uh, every spirit that separates, or you actually, it's really technically the correct translation is dissolves, um, is not of God. I think Philip Schaff like, put separates when he should have put dissolves. Um, but yeah, um, I'll read the Vulgate, the recension of this verse. It's, it's from the Douay Reigns. That's, you know, my favorite Bible, but by this is the spirit of god known every spirit which confesseth that jesus christ is come in the flesh is of god and every spirit that dissolveth jesus is not of god and this is antichrist of whom you have heard that he cometh and he is now already in the world and so we see actually that in the holy bible we see that the heresy of nestorius the dissolving of the union of christ is condemned as antichrist. There's very few times that the antichrist movement is referenced in the New Testament. This is one of those times. So it should draw our attention as to the seriousness of this pernicious error, which the Council of Ephesus corrected. Remember how I said earlier in the stream when reading St. Theodotus of Cairo when we were doing that? I said, I talked about this epistle of St. John. This is what I'm getting at. St. Theodotus and the Council of Ephesus speak in depth about how all diophysites dissolve the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Subdeacon Daniel, can you read from St. Gregory of Tatev's book of questions? Absolutely. Just want to let you guys know, uh, a priest uh, messaged me uh, saying, God bless you all in your service. Thank you, Abuna. Okay. Um, let's see here. Thank you, Abuna. Would uh, would now be a good time to go into Yusuf's paper uh, regarding the uh, 
the Nestorians are relating to Kalsadon and the Nestorian support of Neil and Flavian? First, I, I'm almost done. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and Daniel, if you could, for the stream, read from St. Gregory of Tatev's Book of Questions, that quote, and then we'll finish with St. Pope Benjamin, and then I'm all done with my stuff. Okay. Now the heathen and the schismatic are equally ungodly, for like a dog, he, the heathen or the schismatic, returns to his vomit, that is. He did not have that heathenism, and he denied his this orthodox faith and turned from there. Moreover, the schismatics' case is even worse. Likewise are the new schismatics, Chalcedonians, the forerunners of the Antichrist, the followers of Nestorius the Damned, and Leo the Sacrilegious. So we see that the Holy Fathers recognize this connection. Uh, even if the St. Gregory of Tatev's Bible didn't have the dissolving, um, and just had like the standard one, everyone that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh, he still recognizes that the Council of Ephesus applies this to all uh, of the, you know, diophysites. And so as Orthodox, we can't point to St. Gregory of Tatev and say, you know what, St. Gregory of Tatev was wrong, he was judgmental, because who are we to question the Holy Spirit who inspired the Holy Bible and who inspired the Holy Fathers at the Council of Ephesus to say what they said. Who are we to say that to fight against the Holy Spirit? Like St. Cyril speaks of uh, Diodor's old company, we would be a Nurotomachian. We would be a fighter of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, Deacon Daniel, um, can you uh, go to the last from St. Paul Benjamin, the first of Alexandria, from his homily? On Cana and Galilee, and read this for me. Now sit yourself down, Judas, with your wife who gave you this evil advice, and prepare for yourself a rope for the time when you will hang yourself, die, and your soul perishes in Hades, the place you will go to. I do not invite you at all to my wedding feast. That is the church. Indeed, I will say that a single Judas betrayed his Lord at that time but i do not know from where all these judases came for you will ask me do you do you know who they are i will tell you about each one of them he is arius he is nestorius he is macedonius he is the impious leo he is ibas he is theodore he is theodoret he is leontius he is the abominable julian he is george the arian and gregory his brother who resembled him in his deeds he is the one whose name is not worthy of mention. He brought great evils upon the church, the impious Cyrus, who was defiled in all his deeds. He is Victor, the bishop who bears the sins of his whole city. And he is also Maladius in Upper Egypt. Are they not all Judases? They were cast out of the wedding feast because they did not wear wedding garments. Thank you so much, Subdeacon. And uh, with that, I pass over the baton to Dionysius, for the rest of the presentation uh, screen time. Thank you, Dioscoros. Dionysios, uh, what is that? What is? Where did you want to go next? The paper, your paper. This one. Sorry, I had. Uh... Okay, now the issues have gone away. Um, so I'd like to go into this is this is uh, directly uh, linked to the purpose of this live stream, which is Mar Mari um, uh, and his Nestorianism. Why why is Mar Mari being condemned so so harshly by the Castanians when in Chalcedon and and uh outside of Chalcedon, the Nestorians supported uh the Senate and the Nestorians were led back into the Senate uh who were rightfully condemned. So let's take a look at uh the Nestorian support of Flavian um and Leo by Nestorius himself. Um could you read um the first couple of quotes you see how there's a uh, quotes uh from the stories of Constantinople? Yes. Uh, where it says this is often under it. Do not receive. Do not receive. Okay. 
Do not receive or accept the heresies of Valent Valentinus and Apollinarius and Arius and Mon, for their words are sophistry. They are not true. Their teachings are odious, condemnatory to people, and worthy of being anathematized. Rather, have faith like the holy sons of our ministry, the teachers, Flavian and Leo. Pray that the ecumenical synod takes place and that my teachings, which are common among all the Orthodox, are confirmed by it. I think that when all this takes place, it will be with God's help. Miss Doris of Constantinople, letter to the inhabitants of Constantinople, section 18 and 19, translated by Brooks. Keep going. So, yeah, so I one thing to comment. So oh. we can see that before Chalcedon, um, this source is aware of, of Flavian, what happened and what was conf uh, confessed at the Flavian Home Synod of Tignitus at the Union, and is praising uh, Leo and his Talm. Uh, the Talm uh, might have been sent to end by Theodoret or uh, another uh, Nestorian colleague. Um, and he's, he's actually praying that Chalcedon takes place and that St. Dioscorus and Eutyches and all the people who were friends with St. Cyril, because we have to keep that in mind. Eutyches wasn't just some random. He was, uh, he was, he used to be, before he fell into heresy, he used to be, uh, St. Cyril's and St. Theodosius, uh, Theodosius's, uh, the emperor. Uh, he used to be very close to them and a huge, uh, supporter of orthodoxy, uh, back in the day. Uh, next quote. Next quote, yeah. I know what Flavian, the God beloved Bishop of Constantinople, has already gone, done against Eutyches and those who agreed with him from the beginning. Eutyches has always been an enemy of the true faith. He dared to say that the divinity changed over time and that God the Word was flesh like us and proclaimed that he was born and suffered. I also know what Leo, the faithful head of the priest, did, struggling on behalf of the fear of God and against this so-called synod. I glorify God with great zeal and pass all my days in praise. You who are trained by God know truly that these things, defined by these holy men whom I mentioned, Flavian and Leo, are my own offspring and doctrine, who is to say, which is to say, they belong to the proper reverence for God. Why, when everyone holds these things, especially the clerics, am I alone admonished as a heretic and condemned and hated out of jealousy? The stories of Constantinople, letter to the inhabitants of Constantinople, section one, Brooks. So we can see from this quote, Nestorius, uh, just like the Chalcedonians we have today, just like Michael Lofton, just like all these various people who uh, hate uh, St. Dioscorus, and hate uh, really the orthodoxy that St. Cyril taught. They, they hate the Flavian home. Uh, they hate uh, the Holy Council of Ephesus too. And they hate uh, everything that was accepted uh, at Ephesus 1. But they accept uh, Flavian and Leo and the Nestorian formula that was accepted at, at Chalcedonia and the Nestorian formula that was accepted by the Chalcedonians uh, uh, well, the po I guess the uh, Castilians, the people who would support the Castilians later, um, it, it, they're all they're all the same. Uh, they're all the same. They, they the historians, the uh, Castilians, they 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 make the same arguments. They they hate. Uh, frankly, they hate orthodoxy. Uh, hey, if you wanna, if you wanna go to the next uh, call. Okay. And wrongs were being increased against all of them who agreed with him and his fellow believers, referring to the condemnations of 449. And further, I was among the first in severe persecutions and in flight and in exiles and in commands whereby authority was given in every place unto them to do what they were purposing, since I and Flavian certainly thought the same things. Keep going. This is in the story of Bizarre of Heraclides, Book 2, Part 2. Yeah, go, go, go to the, yeah, go to the second quote. And because they were filled with suspicion about me and were not believing what I was saying, as one that dissembles the truth and represses exact speech, God appointed for this purpose a preacher who was guiltless of the suspicion, Leo, who used to preach the truth undaunted. Uh, Nestorius of Constantinople, Bazaar of Heraclides, Book 2, Part 2. So we can see that, uh, we can see that Nestorius really, really, really 
loves Leo and Flavia. <laughs> like he really likes he really likes what they're what they're doing there. Um uh and the this last cool year is really the, the nail in the coffin for whether or not Castledon was historianizing, uh or if the historians agreed with it. Um if you if you'd read it uh, for us, please. Yeah. But we know that we know not two sons or Christ or sons or only begotten or lords, nor one and another son, nor an original and a new only begotten, nor a first and a second Christ, but one and the same who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature. Can a man, when he hears these things, say that something else was said by him and by those at Chalcedon and by Leo? For openly he is bold and knows the same Christ who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature, nor has said two Christ and two sons and lords. And the council of Chalcedon said, One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, in two natures, not changeably, not confusedly, not divisibly. Historius of Constantinople, Fragment 308. So we can see that after uh, Chalcedon, he was pleased with the formula accepted there and accepted it as his own. Um, and we can see that also like in the uh, Chalcedonians uh, from before uh, 553, like we have, I mean, uh, Paul the Jew, uh, Gennadius of Constantinople, the open historians, uh, providing, I mean, <laughs> easy, easy targets for our, our fathers uh, after the uh and uh after Chalcedon to say hey look you guys are literally venerating the stories and his teachers like can you guys can you guys not be any more clear than the historians uh the second page is going to deal with uh Ibas of Edessa who was rightfully uh condemned at Ephesus 449 for his historizing uh his historizing uh heresies um these quotes are the accusations that were brought by him, uh, brought against him by uh, his own priests and people who were uh, a part of his own church. So this is this is basically like Chalcedon uh, allowed to be back into the church. Um, and it's important to note that these are all after the final of reunion of four thirty three. So. The Nestorians already had their chance to come back to accept the form of reunion, be fully orthodox, and not return uh, back to the heresy. But as we could see, uh, I mean, had they had these quotes speak for themselves? <laughs> uh, if you if you uh, read them, uh, Daniel, they're pretty pretty short. Yeah. The Jews should not boast, for they only crucified a mere man. The Jews could not boast that they crucified God. They did not crucify God. Hell being only, hell being only a threat. If God were dead, who was there to raise him to life? It was one person who died and another who was in heaven. One person without beginning and another subject to a beginning. One person of the Father, another of the Virgin. We must discreetly make a distinction between God and man and make a separation between him who was assumed by grace and him who, who assumed him by grace. I don't envy Christ becoming God, for as much as he became God, so also have I. So, so remember, this is the Nestorian um, that was rightfully condemned at Ephesus 4, uh, 39, but this, this council is being condemned uh, by Chalcedonians to this day. And Marmari hasn't said I mean, anything almost as bad as this. So why, why is Marmari being condemned for not uh, saying Theotokos uh, or ex explaining it in a historian manner when this is, I mean, basically one of the heroes of Chalcedon. Um, and so the next is the letter of Ebos, which we all know is heretical, and we all know was read out um, in the Council of Chalcedon. I mean, Richard Price goes into in-depth on uh, how uh, it wasn't just a fake letter, it wasn't a different letter, it was this exact letter that was read and was accepted by the main uh, legates uh, of the Senate. Uh, the main people legate uh, was specifically there to 
uh, be the representative representative of Publio. All right, awesome. Uh, if you could, uh, okay. if you yeah. could read. Okay. Since the time of your righteousness was here, a controversy arose between those two men, Nestorius and Cyril, and they wrote harmful tracts against each other, which were a snare to those who heard them. Meanwhile, Cyril, his desire to refute the tracts of Nestorius, slipped up and was found fa falling into the teaching of Apollinarius. For like him, he also wrote that the very God, the Word, became man in such a way that there is no distinction between the temple and the one who dwells in it. He wrote the 12 chapters, as I think your righteousness knows, asserting that there is one nature of the Godhead and the manhood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that it is wrong, he said, to divide the, the sayings that were uttered, whether those spoken by the Lord about himself or by the evangelists about him. How packed this is with every form of impiety or holiness will know even before we say it. For how is it possible that in the beginning was the word be taken to refer to the temple born from Mary, or that you have made him a little less than the angels should be said of the Godhead of the Begotten. When we learned that on the occasion of the deposition of Nestorius carried out by them, they had also proclaimed and confirmed the 12 chapters composed by Cyril, which are contrary to the true faith and expressed the agreement with them as if they were in harmony with the true faith. All the bishops of the Orient deposed Cyril himself and decreed a sentence of excommunication on the other bishops who had endorsed the chapters. One of these was the blessed Theodore, the herald of the truth and teacher of the church, who not only in his lifetime compelled the heretics to accept his true faith, but also after his death, bequeathed to the children of the church a spiritual weapon in his writing, writings as your righteousness discovered from meeting him and became convinced on the basis of his writings. While these evils were taking place with each person, as it is written, wandering off on his own, the God we must worship, who in his mercy at all times looks after the church, moved the heart of our most faithful and victorious emperor to send a great and notable man from his, from his palace to require the Lord John, the most holy archbishop of the Orient, to be reconciled with Cyril, who had been deposed by him from the episcopate. After receiving the emperor's letter, he sent the most holy and God-beloved Paul, bishop of Amessa, recording through him the true faith and instructing him to enter into communion with Cyril if he assented to his faith, to this faith, and anathematize those who say that the God had suffered and those who say that there is one nature of Godhead and manhood. So, uh, is it possible to uh, switch the page? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's okay. I will make you uh, reread it. <laughs> we'll have another day's course moment. Uh, so, I, I just want to add something real quick about the issue of um, Theotokos and saying it or not saying it. Um, it's important to note that, you know, just because um, the, individ the Assyrian individual who uh, is being attacked online tends not to say it, especially liturgically. Well, you know who else didn't say it was Gennadius of Constantinople, who is perhaps one of the bigger, I guess you could say, Greek Chalcedonian authorities in the proto-Chalcedonian era. And so scholarship talks about, and uh, Father Shunobi Ishak's uh, book talks about this, it, it has scholarship on this, that Gennadius of Constantinople was not a big Theotokos guy even after the Council of Chalcedon. And so if you're going to attack the Assyrians, then you really need to attack your own proto-Chalcedonians who were before the Justinian era. Um, someone else who rejected that one of the Trinity was crucified according to the flesh was Hormizdas. And when the Scythian monks petitioned for Hormizdas to accept that, um, that phraseology, they said when they heard the ruling from Rome that this must be like a forgery. The, the reason is because they were actually papalists, because they believed in like papalism and, you know, the infallibility and all of that. Um, this is clear from what John Maxentius says. Um, and also, 
Eric Ibarra has a pretty good re recent presentation on the 502 Synod of Rome and how papalist it is and all of that. And keep in mind, Rome was the only part of the Chalcedonian communion at that point in time. So, yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry for the rant. Just keep that in mind. Dionysius. You there, buddy? Call the on me. Uh, no, I had a Socratic debate with the family member. Um, uh, if you, if you would, so like, I mean, this literally praises Theodore of Opsalistia. When has Narmari gone up in front of everybody and praised Theodore of Opsalistia? Well, when has he done, uh, when is he, uh, condemned the 12 chapters? He's never, he's never done all this that Ebos has done. But yeah, it's D, right? At Calisodon. And, uh, as we'll see in the next two quotes, uh, these this letter was was accepted uh by the people in in Calcedon, by the two main pres presiders and the see as spotless yeah yeah and i don't and we'll get we'll maybe we'll get more into this in the next episode but i don't see a substantial difference between um chalcedonianism proper and nestorianism I don't think there's a substantial difference, just a nominal one. And uh, that's what I was saying earlier today, is I was saying, because somebody was saying, they don't say the body and blood of God, they say the body and blood of Christ, and we say the body and blood of Christ our God. They say the body and blood of Christ our God. They say, The Church of the East says that. that I'm talking now against Chalcedonians, they were accusing the Church of the East that doesn't say that. The Church of the East says that. They say this is the body and blood of Christ our God. Just like the Chalcedonians say. The Church of these also says, this is the mother of Christ, our God. Okay? So, it's a nominal difference. The Chalcedonians are making against the Church of the East. Oh, they don't say mother of God. They don't condemn Nestorius. They don't condemn Theodore. They don't venerate Cyril. These are nominal things. So, if they do these four, they're orthodox, automatic. Everything else is the same. You see? So, it's just it's just a name difference. They're, they have the same Christology as each other. Church of the East accepted Chalcedon anyway. I think... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but ironically, the only time they didn't accept Chalcedon was during Ishoyab the Third, who was, if I remember correctly, Isaac of Nineveh's very uh, Catholicos. Yes, that's And true. so the one period in history where, and even his rejection of Chalcedon, by the way, was like the half. Like a, these are heretics like people. Half one, yeah. He was just like, was, yeah, I'm not sure about it. Like that. We, we, basically what he said was he said that they were confused and that they were trying to follow the right faith. And he is the most anti-Chalcedonian Nestorian that you will find. And this is during Isaac of Nineveh. And so it's like, he, and Isaac of Nineveh is his own you know, problem. Um, uh, he's not on any of the Oriental Orthodox Church calendars, so he isn't even a local problem. There are there are some confusions in various uh, circles, and there's a historical context to that. Um, with uh, yeah, we don't even need to get into that. But I'm just I just wanted to say that. Thank you for saying that. Um, and so, in in regards to the letter of Ebas, which was uh, accepted synodically. Uh, we can read the most of our ebos has been proved innocent, and from the reading of the letter, we have found it to be orthodox. This is uh, uh, I, I can't pronounce his name, but he's the he's the re, he's the head legate, literally the the representative Pope Leo, accepting everything that uh, Daniel has just read as orthodox. And then we go to Maximus of Antioch, which is the the uh, other. Uh, co-chairman from what has just been read it has become clear the most devout ebos is guiltless of everything charged against him and from the reading of the transcript of the letter produced by his adversary his writing has been seen to be orthodox i therefore decree that he is to recover the dignity of his, his uh of his see and his own city i mean 
flower. Like, it has, this is just, it, Mon, Mon Mari has never said anything as bad, like, as I, 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 I'm probably repeating myself, but he hasn't said anything uh, as, as bad as Ebas yet. He's being led into the church. I mean, when has Mon Mari said that, uh, I'm not of a God in Christ? This is just, but, and was, just an, let me just answer this, uh, uh, and I'll let you finish your thought there. Bored when you're saying did the, didn't the famous Nestorian bishop is a bishop say that they don't say it is the body of God? Yes. So today, earlier today, uh, a misinformed to say the least, uh, Melkai internet apologist said um, he, that they don't say, they they don't say the body of God. We say the body of Christ, our God. They also say the body of Christ, our God. Christ, our God. They say that. The Church of the East says Christ, our God. The body of Christ, our God. The mother of Christ, our God. They say that. That's what the, the Malachites also do. Go ahead, uh, Dionysius. You were saying. Um, so, uh, I guess that's it. I mean, we could go into see the red being historian. Uh, actually, let's read... Um, did, you, did you have that slide with the, the St. Theodotus quote that I never got to that I would like you guys to do with the nice formatting, the big one from sections 9 and 10? Yes, section? yes. I, we actually go back to my PowerPoint because uh, uh, oh, the Nestorians have an answer for what the two natures are after you Ian. Uh, while well, the Calcedonians don't, they, 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 wa they waffle around a bit on what they are. At the fathers, at least. Um, so, we we could actually like uh did we could read the data right quote just to see just to see uh because it's not it's after the form of reunion and he's condemning uh, Saint Cyril and condemning Theopascism. And I don't recall a Theodore ever repenting of condemning Theopascism uh or condemning uh uh young nature. If that's okay with you guys. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, do you want to read it, Daniel? I think I think your mic is better. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody more with my uh, with my voice. No problem, buddy. Okay. So where are we now? It, it goes from this page to the next page. So it, it sort of uh, in use of paper. He didn't format it correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, what, what does the paragraph start with? Again, after the death of the Blessed Cyril, the same Theodore. Okay. It's in the it's in the smaller uh, the smaller um, yeah, font. Again, yeah. after the death of the Blessed Cyril, the same Theodore, in an address delivered at Antioch in the presence of Dominus, spoke as follows, gloating at his death: "No longer is anyone under pressure to blaspheme. Where are those who say that Christ is the one who was sorry? Who say that God is the one who was crucified?" God is not crucified. The one who is crucified is the man, Jesus Christ, who is from the seed of David and is the son of raised up and is the son who raised up his own temple. The one who is Abraham, who is the one who is from Abraham, it is a man who died, Jesus Christ, while God the word from the seed of David is like David. A man begets a man, but the one who is by nature the son of God is God the Word. Christ is the Son of David, but is the temple of the Son of God. There is altercation no longer. The East and Egypt are under one yoke. Rivalry is dead. And with it, altercation is dead. May the Theopascites rest in peace. Oh, and then if you could go to the next page so they could see the, the rest of the quote. Oh, yeah. Oh, um. There you go. Uh, and then the, the rest is just him condemning one nature after the formal reunion. But um, the reader can, uh, or the viewer, I should say, can, can screenshot and read it because uh, there, there's no need to go in depth into it now. Uh, and, and again, we ask the question, when has Marmari uh, explicitly said this one and the other when the man died, not God? I don't think he's been open about that. I think he's he's been quite quiet on, on, the, on that end of the, the historian uh, spectrum or their beliefs. Uh, I think I think he actually would probably say God died. Um, where, where do we have Theodore repenting of him gloating 
uh, of the death of St. Cyril after, and it's important to know after the full reunion. We do not. We don't. It's, it doesn't exist. Um, so, again, why is Mar Mari being condemned? Was he uh, who is called on Calcedon in Calcedonian circles, the blessed, being risen up as some sort of, you know, era of orthodoxy to these, to these people? It's, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, now, if we could uh, go back to the presentation, so his course uh, could lead us through uh, the Exodus on the Creed. Okay. The, you mean the PowerPoint? Yes, yes. There you go. Oops. Okay, I gotta. <laughs> it's in the PowerPoint. I have to actually uh, take this. I gotta re-upload it because uh, I added it during it. Uh, let me remove from studio, and then I will get the uh, PowerPoint. Make sure it's on there. There we go. It's on there. It should be on slide fifteen. Let me present. Uh, do you score? Are you still there, buddy? Yeah, he's here. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm requesting uh, to present. Uh, Michael, we will not take Saint Pope Severin Zealot's Kiss Be Upon Him uh, slander uh, on this stream. It's a funny joke, Michael. I would like you to, however, look at the homilies of Saint Theodotus because. And Why is it not? Who cares about your soul and wishes to uh see you come into the fullness of the faith of christ sorry it didn't add it i re i uh i uh i re we're having technical difficulties again forgive me i'm in upper east right now i'm from Sahag. uh i farm uh, on the on the, as my job that's my career i'm a farmer so what happened to Severin Zola? He's in heaven, brother. He's locally <laughs> venerated in our Discord server. Come on, man. <laughs> he was murdered. Why? Okay, it's not editing. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, dear scores. I don't know what the heck is going on. This is the. This is a, this is the, actually my voice isn't that bad. This is this is. just read it to us. They they gonna they'll believe us. Don't worry. We'll, we'll include the call in the comments. Yeah. Oh, and if uh, discourse, do you mind reading it for us? You know what? I can't. I, I can't. Uh, you know what I'll do? Is it okay if I leave the studio All and right. then come back? And then yeah, uh, yeah. one way. What's fine? Yeah, you don't need to pull a, a Flavian. You're not allowing me to speak. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just waiting for this guy to come back so we could uh, we could do it. I'm not sure why it wasn't up. So what court are we on right now? Um, the Creed. Oh, I like this one. Mm -hmm. But are you showing it? No, that's why he left. He left right now for that reason. Okay. It's good formatting. The reason why I'm having you guys wait is because the formatting is just so good. <laughs> uh, anyone who knows me knows that formatting is everything. Oh, yeah? It's Yeah. It's very important. Um, Dude, you know, in uh, if you look at uh, manuscripts of, like, Patristic Florilegio, you think these people... Are like are careless with like what font they use? No, they're gonna be very like beautiful, you know. Yeah, uh, we're gonna do. Oh, he's back. Okay. Hey, uh, buddy. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, hopefully, I didn't get the pose. I didn't have my dry summons yet. Uh. 
let's see if it works. How's how's the mic? It's, you guys can hear me. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should go to, and that did not work. Again? You hate to see it, brother. You hate to see it. <laughs> okay. Um. Honestly, honestly, although that quote. Now this is good formatting. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, it intent. Should be, it should be one quote maximized per slide with no white space. No, that's a hint for Yusuf uh, Salib because uh, I just realized how bad the paper was. But the paper's good, but uh, it's not viewable. It's a, you have to like uh, you have to have like an. You know how in Assassin's Creed they have eagle vision. Yeah. You gotta have like for that level of sight. Okay. Um. I want to get into. I want to get into how the Chalcedonians um, don't have it. So that we know what the Nestorians believe is that the the union. They believe in two hypostases, and and they're honest about that. But we need to get into uh, what the Chalcedonians believe because they don't have an answer. We asked them what the teenagers are, and as Issa Salid would say, it's been fifteen hundred years, sixteen hundred years. We still don't have an answer. Um, so here, here is them, uh, waffling their, their father's waffling. Uh, so here is Anastasius and Antioch. Um, I think these scores has more insight into him. I think, uh, they, they quote this, they quote this man, uh, as a father in uh, Nicaea too. So he, he's authoritative in, in some sort of way. Uh, this quote is long, but it, it's very, uh, it goes into way how he views the incarnation uh, to be of of two universals. Um, if you could read it, please, Daniel. Or is it substance? Yes, yes. Sub substance is not a particular nature, but the universal nature. Christ took upon himself our whole substance. And became the first thing of our nature. For because it was his will to deliver the whole of that which had fallen and the entire race had fallen. He submerged himself entirely into the entire Adam. He, the life, penetrated into that which was dead. He penetrated the entirety of that which with which he was united, animating the whole, as it were, like the soul of a great body. Hence, the human race is termed the, the body of Christ. Christ is conceived to permeate the whole equally and yet he dwells peculiar peculiarly peculiarly in each particular each member. member according to the measure of its faith for each member is a separate individual and what holds good of it does not hold good of the corporate body when the apostle speaks of the body and its members he describes indeed the distinction between the genus and the individual but in that, he designates us the body of Christ and not his genus. He meant to teach that Christ was united with the universal generic substance of humanity, not with a particular individual. For otherwise, he would not be called his body and his members. He desired to constitute us all and entirely his garment or body. He was both God and man, but neither a God nor... There's the slide thing in the... Oops, I can't see... Nor a what? I can't see the. Nor, nor neither, a neither God nor no, a man. No. For, and I think the goal could be for he consisted not of like, uh, yeah, and like, uh, general Characterized substance. Not of by more general, general substance. Yeah. He, so he, here he's, he's totally teaching that. Hypothesis, but of general substances. Anastasius Fanti. So here he's, he's clearly teaching that Christ is the meeting place of two universals after the Indian. Um, which is, I mean, very problematic. And then it leads to the whole Godhead incarnating and all of us being in Christ. Um, which Yusuf Salib would, would very, very disagree with because, as he always says, I remember incarnating 2,000 years ago. Does anyone here remember incarnating? Yeah, let me cut in and just say, uh, Barhmar Rabi, uh, Father Peter, uh, Chaldean Catholic priest, my my very good friend. Uh, he's asking, so is Jesus God? Tongue in cheek. What are you guys? What are you guys telling him? 
Uh, the only way for Jesus to be God is for him to be one nature, or else we would only be making a homonym out of the economic uh, dispensation. All right, so just like how we've seen in the Council of Ephesus, we can't say that there are two natures after the union. We cannot say that the constituents the constituents of the union remain two of their category or else the Lord Jesus Christ would not be God. It's because one nature would be only human, <clears throat> excuse me, would be only human and the other nature would be only God. There would be no principle of reality whereby there would be a communication of idioms other than a mere hominem. And as we've seen uh, before, uh, even Theodore the Studite makes this admission that um, the union of natures for the Chalcedonians are is only a homin. Speaking of him, so here we go. We have we have uh, Anastasius of Antioch saying that the two natures at the union are Usia. Right? To, to, uh, to general Usia's uh, so, I mean, that comes with a bunch of problems. The one uh, I don't remember incarnating 2,000 years ago is uh, my internet picture, more use of sleep would say. Uh, another problem comes into uh, that would mean the whole of the Godhead incarnated, and that would have several scriptural issues, right? We don't, we don't see, I mean, we see Christ uh, praying to the Father, communicating with the Father. Uh, that would not make sense if he is the Father himself. He is there's a confusion between the uh, the hypostasis and he's the full essence. Uh, he's, he, like, he's just all the whole essence of the Godhead in him. Uh, we come into in several issues with um, how we can see, how we view other religions. I mean, the Hindus say, say this sort of same thing, right? So... Uh, yeah, and it's also important to note that Eulogius of uh, Alexandria, who is the contemporary of Anastasius of Antioch, and by the way, I think it's providential that it's their pseudo patriarchates, which are parallel to the Orthodox ones of Alexandria and Antioch. They both say the same thing, really. Anastasius of Antioch is much more explicit. Eulogius of Alexandria speaks about this too, though, how the natures which compose Christ are general, uh, universal natures. And um, yeah, it's, there's a historical context as to why it's really only in this period of time that the Chalcedonians were all teaching this weird doctrine, but it's important to note that this is just one of the ridiculous sides of diophysitism in history, if you will, that has been actually dogmatized at different periods of history by the Melkites. Like, they have many contradicting um, Christologies, which they've dogmatized over the years, and this is one of them. So here we go to Theodore the Studite, who uh, is another Chalcedonian uh, uh, figure who's venerated by them. Um, and he has a totally different view. He says here that the natures are individuals. Uh, and he actually sort of seems to mark the idea that it, would, it was two generalities that came together. But actually, uh, Christ maintaining two individual natures, which, uh, as we, we all know, um, individual nature is just another synonym for hypothesis. Uh, Daniel, if you could read this quote for us, please. Generalities are seen by intuition and by reason. It is with the eyes, however, that particularities are seen, as the latter come under the purview of the senses. If then Christ assumed our nature in general and not in a manner that is contemplated in an individual manner, he can be contemplated only by the mind and only be touched by thought. And yet, he says to Thomas, as you have seen me, you have believed. The blessed are those who have seen, not seen and believed. And he also says, place your finger here and look at my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Thus he associates sensible things with other sensible things. So Christ can be perceived and touched and he can be seen by bodily eyes and therefore he is circumscribable. So here it's makes, he's making it crystal clear that 
It's a particular that the human nature of Christ that he believes in, that's numerated after the union, is a particular. It's not just merely an essence, uh, like Anastasius of Antioch, Antioch says. And, and these two quotes uh, go to show that the Castonians. Uh oh. Hold uh -oh. on. We need, we need entrance music. Uh oh. Well, I can cook it. <laughs> uh, if my internet picture of Mary can had told me to confess two natures after the union, I would have placed uh, my two hands over my Discord app and anathetized <laughs> him. Uh, this quotation was was made dogma because my other he, my internet co picture uses to lead uh, had said this in an infallible sorry, Discord call. On? I'm only half paying attention. Well, we we're talking about how they don't know what the two natures are after the union. So well, we're at yeah. the part where we're at the part where it's two individuals. So, oh, uh, I, I remember what I wanted to say. I can. I can. I can. I, oh, I what's, up, what's up? So, so, um, Yarmari in, in regards to these two, uh, conflicting points or views on what the natures are after the union. He, he's just going to be consistent with the, within the Nestorian paradigm and say, yeah, there's two hypostases, deal with it. The Castellanians, the Castellanians don't have a clear answer. They, in fact, they, they contradict themselves. And we have, uh, we have multiple other examples of their fathers contradicting themselves, but these are the two that, that stick out as a, a sort of thumb. Um, uh, does anyone else have anything to add? Uh, do you have the quote from uh, Eulogius of Alexandria? Can uh, can uh, someone read it? Okay, I can pull it up on uh, my computer. I can. Yeah. Zayek. Quais. I can. Are can you, you can you raise the volume on your mic? Uh, let me see if I can. Is this better? Bad <clears throat> Is this better? A little bit, I, a little, I, I, more, I, I, a little more, you, a little more. Uh, I can. You sound, you sound perfect. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, I can't be too loud because I'm at home at the moment. But ah, that's is, why. Yeah. Okay, Habibi. Everyone at home, turn your get speakers for your computers or something. Go ahead. You know, you know, some of the upper Egyptian aunties, like when you get waking up in the middle of the night, it's not good. Uh, I know because I'm from Slide. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here, let me pull up the quote if I can. Um, Who is this that we're, we're reading? Oh, uh, Eulogius. One, okay. um, I'm about to pull him up. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I am sharing my screen now. Or I will in a half a second. Okay, uh, Daniel, can you pin it? I think it's a little better right now, actually. Okay, so here's the quote from Eulogius of Alexandria. Eulogius was actually a friend of Anastasius of Antioch. So this was a whole, it wasn't just one or two individuals. This was kind of a generational thing for the Chalcedonians. This also, entire... they were both deposed by um, Justinian for not accepting the Julianist uh, heresy. Indeed. So both of them, and along with the Pope Gregory I of Rome. Uh, so this is a whole generation of Chalcedonians, all basically viewing it as merely a common nature, not individual in any way, and merely generic. Here in the quote, he says, if the word, if the word did not assume the common nature, it did not assume me. So he believes that he was truly assumed in the, whenever the word assumed the common nature. And then uh, he brings up an argument. If he assumed, uh, in that case, then he also assumed Judah. And he responds, uh, we declare him to have assumed the, the nature, not the hypostatic properties of each one. 
For these make Judah and such a one and such a one. For this reason, when we affirm the union to have been made from common essences, notice again, he's saying it's common essences, merely generic. Uh, we are not compelled to co-introduce all the hypostases under them, as the false accusers foolishly say. Now, before uh, I make any points, I want to just respond to his actual argument. This argument makes no sense. If the union happened to the common essence, then logically, uh, everyone who belongs to that essence, everyone who shares that essence, has whatever belongs to it. For example, if, I, if an essence has the property of being able to walk, then everyone who possesses that essence should be able to walk. That's why all humans, we all have the ability to walk, ability to eat, etc. And so if the union belongs to the common essence, then everyone who shares that essence is now united. So as, uh, as uh, Dionysius said, uh, in their view, this is merely a universal incarnation. Everyone was incarnated. The whole trinity was united to the entire humanity. Every single individual by this logic. And that's all I have no. for this uh, quote. Beautiful. Okay. What else do we have, guys, for the presentation? Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, Dionysius, it's back to you. Uh, I think the, the main purpose of this video is to show that uh, Castanarians, um are willing, near unclear on what the two natures are after the union. Two, do not follow the fathers of Ephesus 1, who clearly, as we've shown, do not accept two natures at the Union. Uh, and, and three, um, are, are in the end historializing and, uh, are, or at the very least, are more heretical than the Chalcedonians. Uh, I mean, uh, I've been the Nestorians who they claim to be against. Um, so, that's all I have to say. That was the main point of this whole stream. Did you guys read that quote that I wanted you to read from St. Theodosius yet? Yeah, that we. Bro, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite quotes. I go around just passing it to everyone. I will, I will, I, you know what? Near the scores of the internet, I will read it myself. Okay. How about that? Oh, and do you want to read it? I mean, uh, I'm sure Yusuf got the call for you, buddy. Anta, Anta, let go. Okay. I hope my mic is still still good. You know, sometimes CC cuts off the electricity. It's it's rough over here. Um, my my voice is clear, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. For, for just as they did not express a dual meaning about the Father when they spoke of him as one, so also when they spoke of our Lord Jesus Christ as the one Son, they did not want to they, didn't, they did not want to be understood in any way as indicating duality. For in reference to God, neither the designation Father implies duality, nor does the name of the Son signify two things. Therefore, the fathers, beginning with the teaching about the one father, introduced the one and only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may comprehend the meaning of the unity of the Father concerning the Son. But, wishing to cloud the simplicity of our faith with urgent words, and being hindered by Christ, who is called by the common name of Son in Christ, he opens this door of blasphemy against Christ, and concerning our Savior, he speaks two declarative things, each one having one name, but two things being set forth. And he says that one name is to be one, but the things signified are two. But if you say the name of the Son is one, and you place the name Christ as one, but you say that different essences are signified by this name, then you do not agree with the fathers who believed in one Lord Jesus Christ, in this way, as they have also believed in one God, the Father Almighty. If their concern was only about the name, and they said there is only one Son, have you selfishly explained have the, how the name is one thing, but the things signified are many? Why complicate the designation, leaving the refrain behind? It was it beautiful? I hope I didn't, I didn't put anybody to sleep with how, how, uh, nice, how nice my... Okay. 
How nice my voice sounded. Yeah, of course, it had the epic formatting and the quote in front of the viewer, but next yeah. time. It's great. Yo, great, uh, I tried my best. Yeah, I tried my best. Yeah. Thank hey, you for hey, that, hey. Maverick. I mean, the initials. Uh, hey, 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 it's Yusuf's fault. Yusuf, like, he, he, I don't know what he did. He, he, he set the quote and I, I copied and pasted it into the PowerPoint, but it didn't, uh, it didn't go through. Okay. I'm glad you guys are friends now. You guys used to hate each other. Okay. All right. Where, where are we now? What are we doing? Um, I can. You have anything? Um, have you guys discussed the argument of why only one nature can save us? And by their logic that uh, a mere man saved us, by Chalcedonian logic. Did we cover that, Dioscorus and Dionysius? Uh, if there's two natures no, after the union, and one no, is I man can't... and the other one is God. Um... He, said, he said that only, only one incarnate nature can save us. Because yeah, it's, it's God becoming one yeah. with, uh, with man. Isn't that pretty self-evident from all of the stuff from the Council of Ephesus that we've read? Well, no. I mean, from a logical standpoint, not from merely patristic standpoint. Let's go. All right. Well, um, if there are two natures and one of, as the Tome of Leo says, and each nature performs what belongs to it, then basically you have you end up having the human nature die for us. Now, if the human nature died for us, then that's not even that's not possible. Then we're not saved. But if the divine nature died for us, then how is that possible? The divine nature cannot die. And so the only logical conclusion is to have a singular nature, a singular composite nature, which possesses both divinity and humanity. So that's able to die in humanity while still being divine. The Chalcedon So the bigger picture is you basically need a whole uh a complete whole which possesses divinity and humanity as parts and this is only present in miaphysite christology only miaphysites say that there is one composite nature of christ now the chalcedonians they argue oh but we believe in one composite hypostasis and this hypostasis is composed of two natures now the issue with this is that it's not honest um, <clears throat> um so my bad, I lost my train of thought. But okay, so if the two natures are generic as they often so, claim. Yeah, so uh, I just want you to include this in your answer. Didn't Dioscuros have a statement that sounded eerily similar to Leo's tome when discussing aspects of each nature? How do we defend this? Okay, I'll, I'll, get, to that I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, just to remind, uh, I guess, everyone, this, this video was, was mainly for Marmari. Uh, I'd like to get into this topic more, you know, well prepared, um, if we could get a chance. Okay, so, as I was saying earlier, um... You like how I can? Honestly, uh, I'll, I'll take my leave, gentlemen. Uh, good night, God bless everybody, God bless, uh... Uh, you, Daniel, God bless. Right okay. Yeah, God bless you, do you yeah, Hello. Hello. So Okay, do, do get out and then have like a six hour right, stream. Um, and may the prayers of all of our saints be with us. This show and, be uh, may God preserve all of his uh, clergy and all of our hierarchs of the church, especially the uh, uh, the one who has. Blessed our show very graciously, His Holiness, more Ignatius Ephraim II. Yeah. So. All right, Take care, buddy. Uh, I would like to clarify that uh, I did not mean to insult anybody on this panel. I just uh, am making it clear, like, uh, um, it's time for me to uh, to go to bed before my uh, another agent who wants to uh, destroys his her son. Good night, guys. Take care, Dionysia. All right. Good night. Um, do you want to uh sit, stay for a couple seconds and yeah, talk? yeah, stay as long as you want. Okay. I would go Actually, even longer than that. No problem. Okay. Well, I guess uh the point I was gonna make earlier before I got cut off. Hmm. Um. So there needs to be a whole. 
uh, a nature that is a whole. There needs to be something that is a whole and identical to both divinity and humanity together. Now, uh, I just I believe I went over. No, I didn't. But I wish I wish that maybe I may, I will in the next metaphysics video, the next part of the metaphysics metaphysics series. Uh, we will be discussing myriology or the, or the concept of wholes and parts. But basically, if a human nature died for us, then we're breaking the commandment of the Bible in Jeremiah 17, where it says, Cursed is the one who trusts in a man who depends on flesh for his, for his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So if I merely a human nature died for us, that cannot save us. Uh, but one composite nature can. And one composite hypostasis that's not a composite nature cannot because a composite hypostasis, it will still not be identical to the two parts. So it's not an actual whole. Because mm -hmm. to be a whole, it has to be identical to those parts together. But in the Chalcedonian view, the hypostasis is individual and the, and the natures are generic or they wish to claim they're generic. They're not very honest about it as we've shown multiple times. Um, then... How is, the how is the whole identical to the parts? The whole is individual, the parts are generic. That's not the same thing. So there's an aspect in the parts, I mean in the whole, that's not present in the parts. Therefore, it's not actually identical to the parts. Therefore, it's not actually a whole. Therefore, a mere human nature died for them. And a mere human nature cannot save us, as the Bible says. Yeah. Uh, now, someone in the chat asked earlier, didn't Dioscorus have a statement that sounded extremely similar or eerily similar to Laotome when discussing different aspects of each nature? How do we defend this? I believe he's referring to St. Dioscorus' letter to Secundius. So I'll pull it up right now for everyone to see. Yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, it's the letter to the monks of Henaton, the monastery of Henaton. <clears throat> I am sharing my screen now. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here, St. Dioscorus, uh, he makes a statement of his faith. I am fully aware, having been educated in the faith, respecting Christ, that he was born of the Father as God, and the same was born of Mary as man. Men saw him as man walking on the earth, and they saw him, the creator of the ho heavenly host, as God. They saw him sleeping in the ship as man, and they saw him walking upon the waters as God. They saw him hungry as man, and they saw him feeding others as God. They saw him thirsty as man, and they saw him giving drink as God. They saw him stoned by the Jews as man, and they saw him worshipped by the angels as God. They saw him tempted as man, and they saw him drive away the devils as God. And similarly, of many other things. But in order to not to make much trouble in writing, I will leave the matter for the purpose of collecting testimonies of everyone, of the heads together, and I mean to collect them by the help of God when a convenient opportunity bids me. So, um, this quote uh, it might confuse some people who are not fi very familiar with patristic terminology. Because uh, the church fathers, they often speak this way. They describe Christ as God versus as man. But this is not the same as saying uh, that there are two natures after the union, each one properly acting. No, St. Dios course was very much against that view. But to speak of Christ as God merely means uh, according to his divinity. For example, uh, I uh, let's say let's say someone ha who is a president, he can act as a president, but if he has another job as a, I don't know, like a, maybe a cashier or something, I don't know why a president would be working as a cashier, but just hear the analogy out. Uh, so if that man, if you have a person who is both the president and the cashier, we can say as president, he signed an official paper. As a cashier, he checked someone out. And so it's merely describing different roles or different aspects of the same individual. But in Leo's tome, when you have two individuals, two natures, each one properly working, uh, you are separating him into two different subjects. 
So it's not the same as Christ doing this as men or doing that as God. No, it's more like men doing this and a separate God doing that, doing that action. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great point. It's the same one doing both things. Yeah, but according to different aspects versus two different things doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't look like we have another question. Is there anything else you wanted to comment on or clarify? I can. If not, uh, uh... <coughs> not really. If anyone has any questions in the chat, go I ahead. I sent you. I sent you in the in the chat something. Let me know what you think. Either way is fine with me. Whatever you you want. Um. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, I replied in the chat. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um... <laughs> okay. All right. If there's anything, if there's not anything else, everybody, thank you for taking the time to watch today. Uh, like, subscribe, share, comment, um, and uh, pray for us and um, if you're not Orthodox, um, you, maybe you're seeing these quotes for the first time, think about them. Um, and yeah, thanks again, everybody. We'll see you guys soon, maybe tomorrow or Monday. We'll see. We have a, we have a video coming up. Um, you guys are going to love it. All right. Take care. God bless. All right, God bless. <clears throat>